you have some crayons, if you have some questions, I can talk about crayons and uh, distress inks as well. And uh, then if you're here throughout the day, I think I come back in another hour and do physics, and then I come back in another hour and do stampers, and I don't know. By the last one, it's very unscripted. <laughs> I don't even remember what we did yesterday, other than we talked about a lot of stuff, everything from scissors to stamps, I don't even remember. I'm like, it was a fun hour though, I think it was good. All right, so uh, I'll talk really about Distress Oxide because that is the newest addition to the Distress family. And this is a really interesting ink because it is a fusion of dye and pigment. It's kind of my dream ink that I uh, brought to Ranger about three years ago and presented the idea to the chemist and said, wouldn't it be great if we could do kind of a Distress ink that had some different properties than Distress does? Because Distress, of course, being my all-time favorite ink, it's a translucent dye, reactive with water, has some really cool blendability and layerability, but because it's translucent, it has its limitations. It has its limitations as to how many layers you can add. It has its limitations to, uh, of course, what surface or what paper that you're working on. I said, it would be cool if we can do kind of a pigment version of that, but I still want some dye. And the chemist is like, yeah, that'd be great, but that's not going to happen. Um, so I think it can happen. Give it a shot. So three years later, we end up with this awesome formulation uh, that are oxides, really. And I say it's a fusion of dye and pigment because that's really what it is. It has both of those ingredients. And to have both of those ingredients kind of exist on the same substrate is what's so unique. Because usually in our ink world, we have dye ink pads, which are translucent inks, and we have pigment inks, which are opaque inks, and pigment pads are often on that spongy kind of uh, pad that's very glycerin-based, very kind of greasy, and I've never been a fan of pigment inks. Um, my whole stamping life, I've never used them, I don't even own one, I just don't like them. But I love the opacity of them. So oxides are actually the same felt pad that a Distress ink is. So it's that same stiff, firm ink, which really allows me to ink up a stamp like normal, blend like normal, but as you can see, they're very, very wet. And they also have a great opaque factor. So here's a little swatch. You can pass it around and take a look at it, but basically all this comparison is, is showing the dye ink of that color. In other words, the Distress, for example, worn lipstick, and the oxide version of that color. Now, these colors, as you can see, the dye is much, much brighter. Okay, because it is fully translucent. So just because we have oxides and just because we get into oxides certainly doesn't mean that it replaces these good old standbys. These can be used, uh, intermixed with one another and create some really cool effects, but I am just gonna focus on oxides and their properties. But when you start getting into darker surfaces, different cardstocks like craft or black or different color cardstocks, you will see that the oxide color really pops out because of that pigment factor. It really has that opaque value to show up on those darker surfaces. So kind of take a look. Now we'll take you through the oxide and just kind of explain it because people say, oh, oxide. That's like a hybrid ink. Uh, no. Hybrid ink is going to really combine oil and solvents, and that isn't. This is still a water-based ink, and they're like, oh, I got it. Oxides are chalking. No. There's no chalk in this, um, because a chalk ink, when it dries, you can touch it and that chalk finish is going to rub off. And although this has that chalky look when it dries, it does not rub off, because it actually oxidizes that ink layer. There's several different things, like this project is done with oxides, the whole background is done with oxide, you can take a look at it. I had some other cards, but I don't know if Mario, oh here's some of them. Um, oxides can create some really cool backgrounds, and that's what I'm going to show you. I'm just going to share with you some cool techniques that uh, we can do with it. This is really the first time I've released a product uh, and really dialed back in my video content of it. I'm usually kind of guns blazing when a, a new product comes out. I'm like, I gotta do videos on YouTube and videos on the blog and all of that. But when I released these at CHA and did kind of those demos there, I really stepped back because I saw the internet go crazy with Oxide, which was an awesome thing. But like, they just kind of made this life of their own and people were getting them and exploring and playing and because there wasn't enough education out there to begin with, people like were empowered to be their own chemists, which to me as a designer was so rewarding. I'm like, finally, finally they are not afraid to play. And so I've really let everyone kind of play and everyone's been playing and sharing and doing stuff on you know, blogs and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube of like, look what I've discovered, look what I discovered. And that's really great. And so now I feel it's the time that my videos can come out. So they were already filmed, they're already done in my studio, but I'm like, I'm just gonna wait. I don't need to hit send. I'm just gonna wait until everybody kind of gets out there. Well, beyond that, um, Ranger has really struggled with producing this. Um, this is an ink that they really didn't want to release. They didn't want to come to market with. Even after the formulation was discovered, they did not think it was great. They actually referred to this as 
um, a desperate attempt for me to bring distress back, and I'm like, <laughs> so, um, yeah. and then when I said I want to call it distress oxide, they're like, that is a horrible name. That sounds absolutely toxic. I'm like, no, it doesn't. It sounds interesting. It sounds like if I heard of oxide, I'd be like, what is that? That's a great thing, but that's really what it, it does. Um, and of course, then we came to market with these 12 colors, and everyone was so excited about it. So thank all of you, because now Ranger is running 24-hour uh, shifts to keep up with just these 12 colors. Uh, they're currently about 100,000 ink pads uh, short of trying to meet demand, which is good. But uh, they did agree to do more colors of oxide, which is awesome. Yeah. So, uh, they plan on releasing a new oxides. I think the next 12 are going to come out this summer. So uh, these first 12, total, totally chosen at random. The only two colors that I chose uh, were these browns. I knew vintage photo walnut stain. <laughs> I, like, I have to have these, these two colors. The rest of them though, I actually separated my markers and just reach in, I'm like, I separated my, you know, my pink markers, my red, my orange, my yellow, and I literally reach in, I'm like, this is the pink oxide, that's it. Because how do you choose? Because sometimes I like worn lipstick, or spun sugar, or picked raspberry, but like if, if I kept moving it around, I would never at least start it with something. Because at that point, I really thought, these might be the only 12 colors that ever exist. So I just need to kind of, I need to go random. But now that uh, they said yes, I can tell you that the next palette is much, much brighter. Um, there's a lot, picked raspberry will be one of them. Um, but all those colors that I was like, okay, now we're talking serious. So now I broke down the rest of the release in groups of 12 that really work well together. You know, whether they're brights or, or earth tones or light colors. So what do these guys do? Let's get into that. The basics, pretty simple. Um, you can try these on a lot of different kinds of papers. Watercolor paper, glossy paper, uh, mixed media cardstock, uh, even manila tags. Now, mixed media heavy stock is a great paper. It's thicker than a manila tag. It's much lighter in color. So it really does lend itself well to dye techniques, but also really great for oxides because when that dye and pigment separate, it remains very vibrant, very luminous, right? So just the basic principle of an oxide, if I take a color, like let's take vintage photo. I'm just gonna go ahead and smash this down and I'm gonna work some of that ink out there. Just really get some of that on the surface. By itself, it's just a pigment, okay? If you use it, it's a great pigment ink, it's opaque, it stamps beautifully. For those that own them, they blend unlike anything else. They're so soft when they blend, but they are still just a pigment ink. The only way to get them to oxidize is to wet them. That is the only way to get them to react is with water. So I prefer to use a distress sprayer. It's a sprayer that's got a little locking toggle right here that locks and unlocks the sprayer. When it's unlocked, it provides a really nice mist, right? Which I like if I'm gonna do a background. But I also have the ability that if I slowly squeeze this trigger, I can get these big drips of water. Those drips of water that happen, that creates some really cool effects. So on this, I'm just gonna spritz it. Now when I first spritz it, you're gonna see that the color really rises to the top, okay? If I dry this, and I'm just showing you one color and then we're gonna get into some magic, yeah. If I keep applying layers of water and keep drying it, it will oxidize more and more and more. That's one thing to keep in mind about distress oxides, is that you can really control the amount of oxidation by how much water is applied. You can also control how much dye and pigment separate from one another the more water you add. So like down here, I'll spray a significant amount of water and you're gonna see that color kind of start to pull aside. So you can see that the more water you add, the more you will get the dye and the pigment to separate from one another. But as it dries, you're gonna see that it all oxidizes. It creates that cool little kind of white milky finish, totally different than what we started with. And every time I add water, it will continue to react. So now I'm gonna go in with just some drips, just so you can see how we can break that up. This is just one color, just so you can kind of wrap your head around oxides, because they're weird. They're different. They're, I'd love to coin all the phrases that I read. It was like, you know, Time Magazine calls them game changer. You know, it was like all, you know, all these different things that people were just, like they all had these little quotes that tried them because they were just really different. So, Wait, Time Magazine yeah. really said that? No. Oh. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? It would be. Yeah. 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 Everybody but, would just make stuff. Yeah. But, but I mean, that, that was really it. It was, it was just... I think a whole curiosity thing that I love, this kind of curious nature as to, you know, especially in our world when we, if you've been stamping or doing mixed media for many years, it's really rare that you see a totally different kind of product. You may see another version of something based off something else, and that's really, I think, the nature of our industry, but to create something that's totally different, 
it's always a risk. You know, not every idea is a good one. You put it out there, and so we were like, yeah, weird. You know, <laughs> but in this case, it was like, hmm, interesting, weird. Uh, yeah, this one happened to be like awesome. You guys love it. So yeah, I'll pass it around. Like, feel it, touch it, rub it. That oxide look is not going to come off the surface at all. Let's do a background. I'm going to take some colors and I'm going to work with my inks and I'm going to apply them to the craft sheet. Now, if you've ever applied inks to a sheet or just inks in general, a couple things to keep in mind. Ink is a suspended medium, which means you do not store ink pads upside down. You can. It makes no difference. You can store them right side up, upside down, on their sides. Ink does not float around in that ink pad. It's just in the ink pad. So however you want to store them is fine. That whole myth of, oh, upside down, makes them wet, fresher, totally not true. It just sits there. So when you apply ink to the craft sheet, you need to press down to get ink out of there. So anytime you see YouTube videos or anything and you see kind of the dancing hands gliding across, I'm really pressing down as I'm applying it. Now, if you happen to take an oxide and you put it in another color and you get ink over the top of it, you don't have to worry about this because you can just wipe these off. It'll blend right into one another. You cannot contaminate your oxides with one another, okay? Unless you re-ink it the wrong color, then I can't help you. All right. Yeah, that could happen, but I can't help you. So here I'm just going to, again, press some inks down. And I'm using my craft sheet as a palette. So in other words, uh, I'll hold this up. I'm not doing like a patchwork, right? I'm not making everything even Steven on the colors. I'm just, if I want more red, I'm going to put more red down. If I want more green, more blue. And I'm really doing things when it comes to oxides that you probably should not do with distress ink. Meaning if you put too many colors of a dye ink down and you add water, it's a hot mess. It's just gonna be super muddy. But with oxide, not so much. So I'm just going to add some. Next comes the water. I wanna add water to where this actually becomes droplets of color. And you can see on the craft sheet that when you do that, you really see those colors light up. Now, one of the things that I think is so important about a craft sheet that people just don't realize, it is not a piece of glass. If you had a glass mat and you just did this, all of your ink is going to be on the floor right now, okay? This is a tool, believe it or not. This is not a silk hat, a baking mat, a silicone mat, all those things that I read. This is really for inking and painting. It is designed to actually hold your medium in place. So if you try those techniques and maybe you don't have a craft sheet and you thought, oh, I'll just try this, and you're not successful, it's usually because of that. Because if you do anything slick and you add water to it, everything immediately wants to migrate together into mud. But when you see it, you're like, wow, that, that ink's just like hanging out. Yes, so I'm just gonna take a surface, and I'm just gonna go in and drag it through some color. Now, once you drag it through, you get what you get, and you don't throw a fit, okay? <laughs> That's what you get, right? The thing to remember, I know, it's a tough one, but what's important to remember with any kind of wet medium, ink, paint, watercolor, it doesn't matter. Wet on wet blends, wet on dry layers, okay? So if that layer is wet, and I go back into wet, wet on wet blends, right? So whatever color is there is going to blend with whatever color is there. And blend is not always a pretty word, right? And like, ooh, I blended background. Well, blending orange and purple and red is going to blend into a beautiful shade of brown. And in my world, that's harmony, right? But really for most of us, it's like, I didn't really want that. Dry just means dry to the touch. Doesn't mean crispy dry, okay? It just means where it's not super wet, but it's dry enough. Now I can go back in and start playing around and really layering this so I can kind of tap a little bit in the blue, kind of get some of that on there. Maybe I want to go into some purple or yellow. One of the most unique things of oxide is because it is dye and pigment, it can layer a color on top of a color. You can layer light colors on top of dark colors. You can do things you could never do before with Distress Ink, right? Because every layer is gonna sit on top. If I wanna break through, again, I'm just gonna take my little water bottle and just kinda splatter some water, okay? That water is always going to react oxide every single time. And remember, the more water, the more it will oxidize. So that's why I like to add layers. I always joke that if I had a holster for this, I'd wear this. Like, I use my water bottle <laughs> for everything. You always have it. The, the thing to remember is like, add more water, use more water. So I've got a background. I'm gonna throw some blue over here on top of that orange. I love that it will sit there. I think I'm gonna throw some orange on top of that dark background and dry another layer and just keep building it. Now, if it looks like sludge, it's gonna dry like sludge. So at some point, you're gonna look at your palette and be like, okay, it's getting a little yucky in that area, okay. Just get that out of your way. Put something new down. So here I think I'll add, I think I'll add some brighter colors on this one. Why not? I think that'll be fun. 
let's do see, some worn lipstick. Let's put some pink in there because pink is probably not the last color you'd want to put on something because you're not going to see it. In this case, we will. Then I'm just going to put a little bit of broken china as well. Again, a little bit of water just so I can see it. Ooh, look at that. Love that the pink will sit right on top, right on top of that color. And I'm just kind of swatting it around. Mm, this is getting good. <laughs> it is. One of my favorite things about this is just that crazy ability to blend these colors that you just would never normally put together. All right. And then I think I want to put in some yellow. Why not? I'm going to put yellow in a different way. I'll show you what I want to do there. All right. So at this point, I'm drying. And you can see I've got these little splots of water. I like that. I'm just going to leave them there. Okay, I'm going to dry those. If I dry those, it'll get a nice outline. And then if I dab it, it will remove what's around it and kind of create these cool little spots. So right now I've got a pretty good background. And I say pretty good background, meaning I like the lines that are in there. I like most of the color, but it's not quite there for me, not what I wanted. And that's one of the things that is really important whenever you work with ink. Once you get your background, I would probably say about 80% of the way, meaning if you look at it and you're like, okay, it's pretty good. I see the colors that I like. I see a little bit of the blend, but it's not quite there. Maybe it's not as yellow as you want or as blue as you want. You should stop at this point from your wet layers, okay? Because even though you can put something else on top, the wet layer is going to completely change the overall appearance or flow of the background. So what you should do is go into your blending tools. Your blending tools really allow you to put color where you want and how you want. So I can take my oxide and I can go in and now I can still blend in some of that yellow and I can blend it right on top. I mean, I can blend yellow over purple and it's still going to be yellow. Just put in that fossilized amber. I can add another color. Now, I can use the same blending tool for different oxides, but you never can use an oxide blending tool with your Distress Ink. Never get any pigment back into this, okay? Those are not designed to blend together. Realistically, I like to change the blending tools if I'm going to change my colors. At home, I've just printed out one of the color sheets from Ranger's website that have like all the colors of oxide. You could pr pretty much print your own, laminate it, put little circles of Velcro, and that's how I store my blending foams for these pads because oxides will never be made in minis. Um, the formulation is just way too complex to exist on a one-by-one -one surface. You cannot keep the dye and the pigment suspended in a small environment. It's just for whatever reason, it just wants to pull the two apart. So there's no plans for them to be mini. So if you're waiting, you're gonna be waiting. <laughs> I'm just saying, I know I love minis too. I love the, the convenience of them and all those great things, but look, not everything could be a sports car. So just kind of, kind of blend some color. So here I'm just blending some of that uh, broken china because I just wanted to add some more blue to my background. So you can see I was able to really control the color, but it didn't change all the drips and kind of swirly lines on there. So I'm pretty happy with it for now. Here's what we're gonna do next. Now, blending foams, if you don't know, these are washable and reusable indefinitely until they separate from themselves. So if you just use them and throw them away, I just say thank you because <laughs> you probably buy a pack of blending foam every week. So thanks for that. That's awesome. But really, you can just wash them and reuse them. So let's talk about the background. Let's create a pattern. We're going to go in with a stencil. We're going to go in with a layering stencil. Let's can see what sort of pattern I Just water? Just water. Yeah, soap and water is all you need. Yep. Okay, let's take, I think I'll take lattice. I don't know which designs I want yet. I think I might want something smaller. I'm gonna go into small ones. All right, so I'm a huge fan of stencils, as you can tell. I like designing stencils in different scale. So I just wanna see, I'm gonna pick a few different patterns. because I wanna show you some cool effects that we can get. All right, what do I want? Okay, I know what I want. Just had to figure it out in my head. I have to see it, to see it finished. Ooh, that's a good one, plan B. See, I started out good, and then... Uh, you okay, need to stop thinking, Tim. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, I needed three, but three this size would never fit in my scale. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take the stencils, and I'm going to use these stencils just kind of as a pattern transfer print. So I'm going to take my stencil, and I'm going to spray water on my stencil. Okay, once I've sprayed water on the stencil, I'm just going to take a towel, and I'm going to dry off the borders, okay, those are solid. So if I tried to print with this, those solid lines would be solid lines. Get where I'm going? All right, then I need a paper towel, here we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 
the wet stencil and I'm going to flip it over so the water is going to go on the oxide. Now, again, water just sits on your stencil. You would think if you flip it over, all that water would be dripping off. It doesn't, it just stays there. So I'm just gonna decide where I wanna put this. I'll lay down just the part of the stencil that I want. I don't have to put the whole thing there. And I'm going to take a paper towel and I'm going to press. I'm going to actually push that water off the stencil. But you would think, wait a minute, you flip it over, it's just gonna drip everywhere. No, it won't. You have to press it off the stencil. Once you do, lift it up, dab it off, and it will lift your background, okay? Just creates like an instant ghost, okay? Oxide's super reactive with water, so as soon as you put it on there, it took all of my ink and put it there. Just sucked it right off, okay? And that's why I used a paper towel, because that water on the stencil, when I push down, it is oozing out under my stencil. So if you try to use a brayer, it would just make water and ink go everywhere. But the paper towel, look at that. When I pushed down, it did ooze the water out, but this sucked it right off the tag before it had a chance, and that's what gave me kind of that design. So we'll do the same thing here. Let's go in with, uh, I'll use this for something else. Let's do this one. Now, stencils, it doesn't matter what side of the stencil you use, if it doesn't have words. Obviously, if it had words or numbers, I'll, I'll leave that up to you because we're making a reverse print. But I just go in and kind of wipe off whatever solid areas I don't want to print because if you don't, you would risk having that really heavy bar of something. So same thing, just gonna flip that over, take a paper towel, just kind of make my little print there, lift it off. Even this, you would think, oh, it didn't work. No, you haven't taken this off yet. The water and ink is still sitting there. When you take that off, sure it did, it worked. Yeah, so when you lift off the stencil and you're like, oh, it didn't work, not yet. But as soon as you do, everything comes off. So that really makes a cool effect. And all this really is, is doing the same thing that this was doing, right? When I was splattering the water and you're creating the drips, it's the same idea. It's just instead of splattering water, we're printing with water. But a cool use for your stencil, especially if you go in and stamp over it, which I will when I'm all done with the demo. But I'll pass this around because I want you to, if you haven't felt oxide, like you just have to, you have to feel it because it's just so smooth and sweaty and you would be so convinced that it's all gonna wipe off on your hands and it just doesn't do that. All right, let's do another background. All right, my next background, we're going to do a totally different kind of resist. This one's a little bit more uh, mysterious. I love it. We're gonna use a product called uh, Distress Microglaze. It's gonna be this stuff. Now, this little jar of microglaze, what this is, is this is basically a waterproof sealer for anything water-based except crayons. It does not work on crayons. It does not work on Neocolor crayons, Distress crayons. It just doesn't work on crayons. I'm not sure why, but it just doesn't. Uh, but this will work over anything else water-based. So that means I can make Distress ink permanent. I can make Tombow markers permanent. I can make watercolor permanent. Permanent as in waterproof. Like put it over the top, put it under the sink, and nothing is going to happen to your paper or what you put it on. You can also use it over photos if you print on an inkjet printer. You can put this over an inkjet photo and that photo is waterproof, smudge proof, fingerprint proof. So it's a really cool medium. You can put it over oxide and it doesn't even change the oxide finish. Because you would be convinced, well if I put this over the top, that kind of cool chalky look is gonna go away. It won't. So we're gonna make some cool resists out of it. Now the principle of this is, let's just say we uh, had something that was done with some distress ink. I have my little foam in there, it's own little foam. Uh, we had something done with Distress Ink. I could stamp or blend or do whatever, put the microglaze on. I would normally apply it with my finger, and then it's waterproof. But I'm going to use it uh, as a technique. And this particular jar was important. I needed it to be that size jar because I needed this to fit inside. Um, say, did you have that in there? Oh, I did. Because okay. once you have a foam, it's always dedicated to your microglaze. So I did this so this fits inside. Okay? That's what we're going to do. So. I know, they're like, why do you need that jar? We have every other embossing powder jar. Why this size? And I'm like, because um, it just needs to be a little bit bigger just so I can fit that in. It drives them crazy. I, like, I'm sure I drive them absolutely insane. All right. For a minute until they get it. Yeah, then they get it. <laughs> yeah. then, then they're super happy. All right. So let's do some backgrounds. I'm going to pick, I think I'll do some letters, some hearts. We'll do some numbers. There's really a ton of creative options for this, which I love. All right, let's do, that'll be a good one too. And they're really all good ones. It just depends on kind of the overall effect or look that you want. And I think I will use that flourish, and I'll probably use a little bit of lattice too. 
So what we're gonna do is kind of start little by little as we build up. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take a stencil and I'm gonna take some microglaze. Now, microglaze, it kind of feels like Vaseline or Carmex if you haven't touched before. It kind of feels very slippery. However, this dries. This has alcohol in it that will completely dry off the surface where it will leave no residue. No residue at all, no shine, no sheen, no nothing. Um, because ironically, it doesn't have any wax in it because otherwise uh, you wouldn't be able to work over the top of it. So what I do is I dip that foam in there and I'm looking at my craft sheet. I wanna make sure that I can see that I have microglaze on there. I just need a very small amount. This is not a, a texture paste or a modeling paste or anything. I just wanna be able to go through. Now when I apply it through my stencil, I kinda do a little dab and twist motion. If you do that blending motion, you're going to force this medium underneath your stencil because it's very slimy, right? It's like pushing that slime under the stencil. So this is just kind of a little pounce, but I do a little bit of a twist, and I'm just going to dab and twist. I love this new stencil, because this is kind of like, it's a grid mixed with dots. So sometimes you get boxes, and sometimes you get circles, depending on how far in the stencil. I like it, it's weird. It's an optical illusion. Mm -hmm. All right, just gonna kind of dab and twist here, a little here, a little there. All right, now. Once you have microglaze on a surface, it is waterproof on contact. Don't need to wait for it to dry, don't need to heat set it, don't need nothing, it's done. So, I'm going to take some colors of oxide, apply some to the craft sheet, use a little cracked pistachio, maybe I'll go in with a little bit of peeled paint. This time I'm gonna kind of stick warm and cool just to really help with the layers. Perfect. Add a little water. Just like before, I'm going to take my tag and I'm going to go right through this. And this is going to resist immediately. Okay? So as soon as we have it, we have an instant resist. Now, microglaze, in addition to using a stencil, you can also stamp with microglaze. So if you don't want to uh, take a stamp and stamp and use embossing powder, la, 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 you can stamp with it. All you'd have to do is take microglaze, smear a thin layer on your craft sheet, dip your stamp into it, stamp it. Now, once you get microglaze on a stamp or a stencil, the only way to clean this off is with rubbing alcohol. So like an alcohol wipe or something like that, because remember, this is waterproof. So if you try to clean it off with water, it won't clean off with water. And if you don't clean it off your stamps, your stamps are un uninkable, because inks are water-based. So just note to self, because it would drive you crazy. You're like, this stamp will not take ink anymore. What is going on? <laughs> Microglaze, yeah. How did I know that? Learn. Because <laughs> I thought I cleaned it up with water. You know, I did my normal thing. I'm like, this stamp doesn't work anymore. How does this stamp not work? How does it not work? I've never broke a stamp before. Um, so I mean, it does seem a little weird. It's like, you know, and how do you get help with that? You're like, um, can you help me with my stamp? What's wrong? It's not stamping. Are you adding ink? Yeah. Are you pushing down? Yeah. And nothing happened? Nope. Yeah. So this is my first layer, right? All we've done is swiped it through. Put that on there. Okay, I'm going to get rid of this ink, and I'm going to add another layer. Dab this off. Next layer, let's do something else. Let's do uh, some flourishes. I'll do a flourish. I think I'll do that down in this area. Again, I'm going to go back in. So that is why my foam, when I tear it off, I just leave it in there. Because once, it's a dedicated blending foam, because I'm not going to clean this foam with alcohol. So I just leave it in the jar, and then when you need it, you just touch it. If you don't, take it out. All right, I'm going to dab this on. Again, going through. A jar of microglaze will probably last you your entire crafting lifetime. It really will. It will last a long, long time. All right, I'm just gonna kind of blend that. So I'm really going into those solid areas now. That's where I'm adding my second layer of stencils. So the first time, as you can see, I put my pattern here and here. So the second time, I'm putting it here and here where I have some color. You'll see, because I'm gonna build another layer. And then I think just because, just to be random, I'm just gonna add couple of letters. Not much. I don't really spell much out. Okay. So now let's choose some colors. A little bit bolder. Something that's going to contrast. Maybe we'll take some red, a little purple, maybe we'll take a darker <coughs> blue. That'll be shocking. Let's use a little orange and yellow. I don't know. All the colors you'd never want to put together. Spray this with water. And this time, I'm just going to go right in. This is going to give me a totally different effect. Now, is that dryer different than a heat tool? Well, n it's not different than a heat tool, but it is different than an embossing gun. That's um, what I'm talking about. Yeah, because they're both 340 degrees, so temperature-wise, they're exactly the same, all right? 
This is called a craft tool, so it's really designed for crafting. It's designed to be an inch away from your surface. You don't have to move it, it won't burn anything. It heats all the way around the surface. It doesn't blow anything, so if I point it at that little drop of water, it doesn't blow it anywhere. It literally dries it in place. So you can use it to dry ink, dry paint, dry paint. If you tried to use it for embossing, it would take three times the amount of time to emboss because an embossing gun actually focuses heat, right? When we emboss, it's that small little circle that heats that plastic to the point of melting it very quickly and allows you to move around. But if you try to use an embossing gun for inks, when you point it at that ink, everything looks like spin art, right? Everything's just going out of the way and bubbles and blisters. So it's completely different. People say, well, do I need both? I'm like, well, do you emboss or do you craft? I do both. <laughs> there you go. You know, that's like, do I need a blender and a mixer? Well, I don't know. Do you mix or blend? I do both. Probably need both. <laughs> um, but it's just one of those things. It makes a huge, huge difference. Um, I love this heat tool. You'll see me use it. I mean, unless I'm embossing something, this is it for drawing because I can dry glue, I can dry paint, I can dry watercolor really quickly. If you ever tried to dry a watercolor background with your embossing gun, you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, come back, come back, come back. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I'm one of you. That's, that's why you have it. Because I know you walk in, you're like, do I really want to buy is another 20? Yeah, you do. Um, so this is my second layer. Now, my second layer, you're going to see, um, and you can just pass that around. I have another one over here that I did. What happens on your second layer by doing this is you have the ability... You can see my second layer here. This is my first two with the box. These are the second layer. The second layer, every time you put microglaze down, it seals what's underneath it. So when you see the second layer, you're going to see that flourish and that lattice, but underneath it, you're going to see the green because it will seal it. Once you put microglaze on something, that layer you put it on is forever sealed. But the cool thing about microglaze versus gel medium or Mod Podge is you have the ability to put something over it. So ink will go over it, but it will never cover what you did. So you can put microglaze onto, you can make a watercolor card and decide, you know what, I love it, it's perfect. I never want anything to happen to this watercolor. You're just gonna dip your finger on there, rub it into your paper, take a dry paper towel, wipe off anything excess, and touch the card. You feel nothing. That microglaze, there is literally nothing there. Uh, not because it was heat, it will actually evaporate in air. But I love the fact that not only can I use it as a sealer, but if you have chalk, if you have perlex, if you have perfect pearls, you can mix those with those powders and you could have metallic rub-ons that you can put on your card or on your uh, die cuts. If you uh, like to use this in an art journal, let's say you do an art journal and you've done a lot of gel medium in your journal pages and you go to open up your journal and it's like a fruit roll up, it just kind of rips apart every time, you can put a light layer of microglaze and nothing sticks to itself. So it's really a cool background, a cool surface. So that's what I love about working with this, is that if I'm going to use it as a medium, it's going to forever seal whatever it is I'm doing, which is pretty cool. So if you do use it on a background stamp, yep. how long, I mean, do you have to wipe it off right away, or next week you can use an alcohol? Yeah, wipe or next year if you forget you did it and it's not taken, you can clean it off. <laughs> <laughs> which would be me, um, you know, because you're so in the zone that you, then you're, like, you're happy with what you did, you put everything away, and then next time you take out the stamp, it's not working. Microglaze, yeah. So there, there's really no time, if, because the microglaze will, will always just come off with the solvent. And it's not anything scrubbing, it's literally like if you get an alcohol wipe, you could just one time over your stamp and it all comes off. It's not like you gotta scrub it off or take it off. It, it doesn't ever go on goopy. That's what I really like about using it. Do you have to Pretty worry cool about the jar being open so long and drying out the jar? No, no. You wanna to touch it, go for it. It's literally like karma. Hey Jim, have you ever done any techniques like with yeah. alcohol? Um, the alcohol, because the alcohol cleans it, the alcohol would just eat it away. Yeah. yeah, it's gone. But this eats crayon, you can clean it. Uh, it just uh, it's like now what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> now what do I do? Okay, let me show you something else to do uh, with stamps. I love to show this. This one's really cool. I think we'll do we'll do something with the seascapes for this. One. I'm gonna take some stamps. Look at my grid blocks. I'm gonna use uh, this set. I think most of these look clean. I only clean my stamps with water. That's just personal preference. Just how it is. I don't like to use stamp cleaner, but if you like stamp cleaner, really go for it. I just clean things with water. Just to me, whatever comes off, 
with water would be the only thing that would transfer. So I put on a fresh blending foam. That's the key for this one. All right, here we go. So let's, let's start with this guy. He's pretty big, so we're gonna take our stamp. Now, I like to work with cling mounted rubber stamps. It's cool, but you can use cling or clear. Uh, my advice, and I know most people don't take it, I give it anyway, um, is that if you clean your stamps with stamp cleaner, they really don't like to take ink again. It's just the nature of it. Stamp cleaner contains a solvent and a conditioner. A solvent is what cleans the stamp, a conditioner is what conditions the rubber or the polymer. So anytime you use cleaners on there, sure, it takes the ink off, but it leaves behind a layer of conditioner or oil. So you have oil on your stamp, and oil and water don't mix. So when you go to ink up a clean stamp and your ink just kind of is beaded up, kind of sitting there, that is why. So when you buy a brand new set of clear stamps and you try to stamp them with distressed ink and they stamp off splotchy, that is why. So my advice is get yourself a permanent ink. Um, I like to use archival, but there's other different types of inks. I don't even know if I have enough. Where is my archival pad? Yeah, it's here. No? Did I not take it out? I'm in my bag somewhere. Hey Mario, do you know where my archival is? Have you seen it? Oh, uh, let's see, this is what I get for being organized. Normally, uh, there it is, thanks. Your uh, oh, thanks, more phones. All right, so archival, like when I get a brand new stamp set, I'll literally take my archival ink, I'll ink up the whole thing and put it away, okay? I don't cover it with a thick layer, I swipe it on so it just stains that and that's it because this is permanent. It's gonna dry on here permanent, it's never gonna transfer again, but every time I use that stamp, it's gonna ink up perfectly. Like I said, you probably won't listen to me, but Trust me, next time your stamp won't ink, it makes a big difference. All right, I just swipe it on because you want a thin layer. Because if you really juice it up with black ink and you go to put it away, it's going to stamp on everything. Yeah, it just puts a thin layer. So my advice is try it on the stamps that you hate, and then you'll see. <laughs> you'll see that it works. You're like, okay, I'm gonna listen to him because I hate this set anyway. And then you'll be like, wow, that really works. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. What we're gonna do on this technique with oxide is we're really gonna take the properties of the dye and the pigment and we're gonna separate them. Okay, that's what's gonna be really cool on this. So I'm gonna take my stamp and I'm gonna ink it up. Again, a great thing about oxide being a felt pad, I can be aggressive, right? I can ink this up without getting like a pigment ink pad and it just inks up everything, all the insides, the block and uh, yeah. So this really allows me to ink up my image. Good detail, yes. So like I'm confused, like so if you already put down the black archival mm -hmm. and now you're putting down the turquoise. Mm -hmm. just this was dry, this is waterproof. So as soon as it dries, it's permanent, never coming off. Oh really, so mm -hmm. it doesn't come, it doesn't contaminate your turquoise. Can't re-wet, nope. Oh. So I mean if I had just put on black and just put on this, then yes. But this was done when I got the stamps. Okay. So I didn't recently put this on. And the reason why you're putting the black on there is to improve to prime the stamp, like seasoning a frying pan. Yeah. To cover just that raw rubber or raw polymer. To get a better impression throughout the life of To the get stamp. your ink to stick. Yep. Or to get your ink to, to get your ink to stick to the stamp. Because now you can see that my ink is completely smooth across my stamp. It's not bubbled up or kind of you I mean, really you know what I mean when you do a clean stamp and all of a sudden your ink just kind of pulls into one another and creates these little pockets and it's not sticking to the stamp besides microglaze, it's probably mm -hmm. that your stamp was too clean. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just gonna go in, I'm going to stamp the image. And you can stamp with good pressure. You don't need to be a CPR stamper. You know, you don't need to you know, do that. Just give it some good pressure. When you take it off, I'm going to take that blending tool and I'm just going to immediately smudge. Circular motion, smudge it. So here's what happened. Because this is a dye and pigment, the dye immediately stained the paper, the pigment sits on the surface a little bit longer, and the blending tool allowed me to move it around. So my image is not blurred, my image is actually stamped perfectly crisp, but what you're seeing is a halo or a haze of color on there. And I'm just gonna keep layering. So you could do a lot with this, with what's left. I mean, if you wanted to create a watercolor with oxide, of course we can spray the stamp because that just makes it better. We can stamp this, lift it, we could dry it. So I mean you could, if you sit around with your paper long enough, I mean you can create all sorts of cool effects because even when you stamp with watercolor, this is all about drying that layer and you can create just an awesome watercolor oxide with this too. That's not the idea, we're gonna go back to this, but just to show you that sometimes people will do this technique and because it doesn't use a lot of ink, you think, well I don't wanna waste that. Great, then do this and have one of those handy and make two projects at once if you want. 
All right, so I'm gonna take another stamp, another color of oxide. Now, when it comes to tiny stamps, I like to use bigger blocks because I always say I have pork chop hands, so if I try to you know, put this stamp on this block that it would fit, by the time I get this down there, this is all in the way. This is just not happening. And for those of you that have fingernails, that's always another challenge too, is kind of you get about here and you just stop yourself. You know, like, right? So for me, it's not my fingernails, it's just my fat little fingertips. It's like, I'm, and I end up like dropping the stamp. So it's just a, a good tip if you have smaller stamps, just get yourself a longer block because then you can put it where you want and you can be over here with your stamp. So here I'm just going to go in I'm going to add another color of oxide. I'm going to go in, stamp it, take the blending tool, and smudge. And I do this one at a time. But again, you can see that really cool kind of luminous glow around what I stamped. The image, great detail, but we just keep blending these layers. I'm just going to keep going with this. It's cool because one color sits on top of the other. All right, let's do this. Let's do a little red here, a little fire brick. All right, let's go in this way, perfect, stamp it. And I'm using the same tool for all of these colors because technically I'm not applying ink, I'm simply smudging ink. So there's no other color that's transferring. It's good, it's fun. I know it becomes like this endless game of how many colors can I layer? A lot. Let's do a purple fish because, I don't know. Let's do a purple fish with a little bit of marmalade. <laughs> All right, because we can. All right. Perfect. So these are all my clean stamps that I'm putting away. You can see that's what I consider clean. All right, let's go in with a little bit of, no, let's do this. I think this is going to be more coral this time. So if you work fairly quickly, you can probably get a couple of stamped images before you smudge, but you probably want to smudge, I don't know, within a couple of minutes. So like, don't go take a snack break if you're stamping. You know, as long, you don't have to smudge immediately, but you want to do that just within a couple of minutes just to make sure that the pigment hasn't had a chance to set. Because that is all we're doing. We're really separating that dye and pigment from that surface. green, green, and smudge that. So once you've kind of filled in your area, okay, you have images, you've smudged them all. I love that I can see them all. Now I'm gonna go in and add color. Because yeah, even though I was able to smudge color, I still wanna add a little bit more color to this guy. I think that's what's going to make it interesting. So I'm just going to take this, oh, I'll just use that same smudgy one. I'm just gonna go in and add some color. Now, when I add color with a blending tool, just kind of become a little bit more haphazard with yourself. Don't sit there and think you need to frame everything. I think a lot of people, when they use a blending tool, they're used to taking that, right? Ink around the edges. You don't have to. Just kind of do the dance. Maybe you want to add some color, thin off the excess. And when I pick up color, I'm just kind of blending that right over the top. And just kind of put that around kind of get a little color going through there. Perfect. Once you're happy with it, now I'm just going to go in and I'm going to drip some water on there. Now, the longer the water can sit on a surface, the more dramatic the effect is. So I'm just going to turn on the heat tool. And what that does is anytime water hits distress, the ink underneath that water droplet is trying to get out of the way. It's literally moving away from itself, but it's hitting the edge of those drips. The longer it can sit there, the more ink is going to build up around the edge of that drip. Does that make sense? Think mm -hmm. of just something trying to get out of the way and they hit the wall. So the longer you get them to hit the wall, when you touch it, it will outline all of those drips. So that's what creates more of like those bubbles or that whole little outline effect. If you wanted it to be more subtle, well, then you could just leave it a little shorter. You just put it on and take it off. And then I'm just gonna add one more layer of ink because we can. So here I'm just going to take some oxide, mix some color, and add a little water to that. 
take a little splatter brush, pick up some color, and just splatter some color. Okay. A little splatter brush is just going to give me just really quick ability to just splatter some little drips. And the idea is to not get any on your hands. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't get any on your hands, sadly. I know. But that's kind of our little splatter. So I use a splatter brush a lot, usually mostly on Christmas cards if I'm going to do snow or metallic or something like that. Pretty simple. Nice. Yeah. Really, really simple background. Okay. So, any questions on oxide before I jump and do a quick cram blend? Anything? Yes. Yes. You mentioned the leaf Yes. Um, do these dry bleak, um, These are actually twice as wet as Distress Ink. So I would probably say you need to re-ink, if you use them a lot, maybe every six months. That's if you're using it every single day for those six months. If you don't, maybe once a year. Yeah. One of the products that I use a lot is called Distress Refresher. It's a little spray bottle of resin. That's kind of my go-to. Whenever an ink pad is just not as wet as I want, I'll use that first before I re-ink it. And that works because on the oxides. It does, yeah. It works on oxides or distress. It's called Distress Refresher. It's actually a, it's a slightly smaller spray bottle and it's just a clear resin and it rehydrates anything water-based. You can use it on markers, ink pads. Yeah, it's really nice. It just kind of makes it wet again, but it's not the magic re-inker. Obviously, you know if you've had your ink pad for a year, year and a half and you use it a lot and it's just done, you need to re-ink it, so, yeah. Uh, I, I use Margie big brush markers mm -hmm. and I just get so frustrated with them I'll get out my glycerin my water meticulously drip fill them then six months later they're dry again and I'm going like oh I don't want to go through this will the distress refresher work on the Margie big yes. brush markers yep will probably work better than glycerin it, because it's it, it contains the in. appropriate resin yeah glycerin is what's in soap so it actually contains a water-based resin that makes it slippery. So glycerin yeah. is in soap, but the stuff you are using for the it's not resin glycerin. is not soap. Yeah, it's not glycerin. It's a resin. Okay. You said yeah. separate sponges for the distress and for the oxide. Two two yeah, separate. only because this has, this has pigment, okay. and kind of once you get pigment in there, these okay. just won't blend clean. Okay. They'll actually yeah, get so pretty muddy. Two separate yeah, I mean, this gotcha. formulation is really complex. I mean, it... It, it, when you break it down, you're like, oh, it looks pretty simple. It's like kind of a pygmy version of that. It's way complex. I mean, it's so complex, we haven't even figured out a way to spray it yet. You know, I would love, you know what I mean? I would love oxide spray stains. And I'm like, well, gosh, just kind of take that reinker and put it in water. And the chemist is like, no. Yeah, because when you add that resin in it, it just creates another layer that it literally separates. Like, if you own the reinkers, anyone own them? They look horrible, right? You look at that yeah, bottle of anchor, yeah. like this stuff looks yeah. horrible. And then you shake it up and it kind of gets all mixed again. <laughs> that's that's the whole thing. That's so what I, I was can't talking make about. A spray with it. Okay. You cannot make a spray because once it separates, it will not blend back together. Yeah, so we are working on that. We're trying to work on what is that resin. It's not the same resin that's in our ink pads. What is that ingredient that even though it settles, will allow it to mix back up again? You know, the chemist is trying to explain like salad dressing to me. It's like it needs to emulsify because even if you shake it, it's still not mixed. So when you spray it, it's going to like spray more color, spray more. He's like, it's not going to spray the way you want it. I'm like, I know, but I really, really, really want it to spray. And he's like, I know you do, but I really, really want it to work. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> See, sometimes I'm a little impatient. All right. So we'll do a little quick demo with uh, crayons. Distress crayons, just, it's a fun medium. It is a water reactive pigment. I'm going to apply those to a tag that has some gesso on it. I just took a little bit of Dina Wakely gesso and just skipped over it with a palette knife just to create some texture. And I'm going to go in with the crayons. The crayons are just fun because they um, have the viscosity kind of like a lipstick. They're really creamy when they go onto a surface, but they have a drying time. So when you apply it to the surface, you need to put them down and you need to blend them uh, fairly quickly, otherwise they're going to dry. Now depending on your surface, if your surface is sealed, you'll have a little bit more play time but this only has gesso in certain areas, so I need to work a little bit at a time. You can add a couple of colors if you want. You don't have to worry about contaminating them, and you don't have to worry about your crayons drying out, but you do have to change your blending tools if you are going and blending different colors, otherwise they will all blend together. Now I'm just sitting here just applying color, and I'm going to do that over uh, the whole tag. 
So I just carefully apply them, paying close attention to the order that you put them on. And then I'm just gonna go in and blend. And when I blend, I'm really thinking my finger is kind of like a paintbrush. I'm not sitting there stirring it all together. I'm just moving it a little here, pushing some of it there. If you don't want some color, just wipe it off. Crayons, because they are an opaque medium, you have the ability to layer any color on top of another color. And you don't always have to use a lot of that color. You can go in and scribble uh, just a little bit of some color. And the ones that I don't plan on using again, I cap, and the ones that uh, I plan to use again, I just leave them open. So there I'm just starting to blend, and I love putting color on top of another layer. This is going to get really, really interesting. Now, if you needed this to move a little bit more, you could take your finger and you could uh, dab it onto a baby wipe. That's gonna help move that color around. If you need to clean your fingers, you know from being in class, just a little water and pff, gone. All right, let me add, let's add a little Are bit of purple. Like lipsticks, like, like there's a big stick inside and you can advance it with like Yeah, you simply thing. twist the base and that extends the medium or retracts the medium. And they're nice because they really have a, a great kind of uh, creamy, creamy consistency. Now when it comes to storing the crayons, you can store them however you want. I love the fact that we have a, a crayon storage tin. It does hold, it holds about 30 something. Um, it doesn't hold the full set. I didn't want it to hold the full set because by the time you had a tin that held 60 some crayons, the whole time is this. <laughs> Looking for the color. I mean, it sounds really good in your head, but it's not great when you want to go to use it. So I do have two tins. I have one at home that has warm colors and one that has cool because at least that's quicker when you decide what color. You don't have to dig as much, which I think is good. Um, I also like to use this for storage. There are jars. I have some. Got them yesterday. Um, there are jars that fit this. So these are just the small plastic jars with a metal top. It fits 12 jars and it's designed to fit them sideways because you need to see what's in the jar. No point in standing up with the metal lid because then when you close it, you're like, ooh, wait. So two packs of these, six and six, will fit uh, those jars in there. And it's cool because uh, when you're using that, you can store, I use it for embellishments, but I also love to mix my own glitters, embossing powder, sequins, any of that, and just kind of have it at the ready. So, I like to have things that have multi-purpose. Okay, let's add a little bit more yellow. So I'm even gonna add some yellow on top of this, and I'll blend some down there. Okay. So at this point, we've created a cool background, right? And that crayon is dry. I mean, that's the thing about distressed crayons. That's what makes them different than an oil pastel or even a gelato. They dry. Okay? Once they dry, they don't move anymore unless you move them. Okay? I mentioned these were water reactive. It means when they get wet, that's what allows them to move. But one thing to understand that's really interesting is, let's say you wanted to watercolor with them. I'll take a water brush. If I want to watercolor with these, let's say I scribbled some of them down, I could take a water brush and I can watercolor with these. They have great pigment, great, great pigment. I can also scribble them on a surface. I can pick up color and I can color with them this way. So I can watercolor direct or from a palette, easy. And this will never dry on your palette. So if you had a piece of plastic or just an empty distress palette, you can scribble your crayons on there and you could take them to class and not worry about bringing your crayons if you didn't want to but I really love the ability to kind of move this medium around. But whether you color it direct or whether you watercolor with it, if you spray it with water, what do you think is going to happen to it? Nothing. Nothing till you move it. You got it. Good, good, good. I can spray this. Nothing. Unless you move it. If you move it, it's going. And that is why I wanted these to be the way they were. Because a gelato, if you wet it, it is fugitive on contact. So if I'm doing mixed media and I do some crayon and I wanna apply ink spray, I can do that without worrying about my crayon going anywhere, as long as I don't touch it. If I touch it, mm. that's it. So this allows you to spray and blend your inky background or add inks and then dry it and you don't have to worry about your crayons always going crazy. So that being said, I can take this particular background that I just did and we can reveal some of it. You know, we can go in with uh, again, our stencil, and I can take a baby wipe. Now, if I take a new baby wipe, they're often too juicy, so I'll just kind of wad it up in a paper towel. Old baby wipe is better for this. Not used, just old. <laughs> um, <laughs> same. He said to. 
I know. I know. There could be a whole new palette. Yeah. There's a whole new palette based on that. So all I'm going to do is just take that and literally just swipe right through my stencil. Okay. And what that's going to do is it's just going to start lifting off my color. Okay. Now where there's gesso, it's going to be really bright. Where there isn't, it's still going to lift the color. So I think that's just an interesting background to create. Just kind of going through a stencil. Yeah, just adding interesting effects. And it didn't matter how long this was dry, it's always going to uh, re-wet with water. Funky stencil. So it could sit on your desk for a week and then you can come back and Absolutely. finish your background. Always, back yep. It. it will always re-wet with water. And but it's also... But the distress oxide does not, right? Always reacts with water. Really yes. even? Okay. Yep. Unless I sealed it with microglaze. Okay. Be the only time. Yep. Pretty simple. So I'll finish up with one other thing and just talk about a water brush. But I'll pass that around because like... When you look at this, it looks so difficult because you're like, look at all those layers. And for someone that's not our kind, and they're like, how did you do it? You're like, that was weeks, man. <laughs> I, was so I built a foundation of color, and I let it dry overnight. And then, yeah. You would never say, well, I just did gesso, and it kind of smeared with my finger, and I rubbed it with a baby wipe. No, you'd never go there. You know, they're not our kind. I'm going to appreciate it, so why not make the story exciting? Um, so if you, if you um, wanted to preserve that, so that you couldn't come back later with big blood. You would need a spray fixative. Down. You'd need a spray oh, fixative. Not the distress glaze? No, it eats the crayon. That oh, crayon's the only okay. thing. Like, as soon as you touch it, crayon's gone. Okay. We don't know why. It just mm -hmm. does. Um, so I just want to talk real quick about a water brush, because I had a lot of people in yesterday's demo ask about a water brush, because there was a lot of water coloring going on, which was good. So I do love water brushes, and I know there's a lot of different ones, and my advice to you is just to buy the one that you like use what you like, then maybe it's a different shape handle or a different bristle or whatever. Um, you do want to have a water brush that's going to have a reservoir that, can, that controls the flow of water. The detailer is designed because it has a very fine detail tip that allows me just to go in and do thin lines or it will also allow me to kind of create a nice brush stroke, which is nice. So that's why I designed this one, is I just wanted something with very short bristles because when I'm doing my coloring, I like detail coloring. So as far as lettering, I know a lot of people like a little bit longer bristle to create all those swirls and swoops. The other water brush I did is a flat water brush. The flat water brush is really nice, especially when you want to create backgrounds. I'm just going to squeeze some water through it. It creates a really nice wash. If you ever want to create kind of that uh, simple gradation of color, it just allows you to go right across the surface. But one of my favorite things about this particular water brush is if I'm using other colors. So let's say I'm working again on a, a quick background, whether it's a card or a journal page or something like that, and I want to create a little bit more of a, a freeform coloring, instead of using the flat, this has a removable ferrule. So I can snap this off, and now I have a large round brush. So this will allow me to go in and just literally mop my color just with my brush and be much more kind of playful with the brush to create those large brush. So it just creates a big... Yes. So, if, yeah. so that's one of the things that, because it doesn't tell you that on the packaging, but I know. Why not? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an information it problem there. I designed, it, I designed it that way. But they're like, don't tell people to take it apart. I'm like, but that's what it's for. And they're like, quit, don't tell people that. So, yeah, as a designer, I'm just the idea guy. I don't get to control every aspect to market. Literally pop it off. And then when you're done, you just take the bristles as long as they're wet, because they like to stick back together. And then you simply thread that through, snap it on, and it's back to a flat. That simple. So if you have this, it's really nice to know. This one's not removable, so don't sit there. And I don't know what you would probably try to rip off with this one, like a flyer's going, he just said to pop the top off, and oh, now I just have a stub. So, but, but what's, what's interesting about the brush, though, just even looking at this, is really how the pattern that you get. You can't get that play for swirl with a flat brush, right? So that's really why sometimes when you're doing that background, that big brush just kind of allows you to just mop it around and because these are synthetic bristles you don't have to worry about them breaking or bending or damaging it so just little tricks to know I think the more you uh, know with your stuff I love this one so when I designed it I was going to design a round one too because I did I wanted a detailer a flat and a round right but then when I went to the paintbrush shop I'm like well the only difference between that and that is that little thing is squished so I'm like because it's a plastic can I take off that squishy thing They're like if you want we can just make it snap on and off I'm like, oh, 
Yeah. Hey, Tim, yeah. can you quickly talk about the difference between the two rounds? Because when sure. I use them, so I'm really, even doing this, even swatching them, yeah. I can see that they're slightly different. Extremely different. But <laughs> <laughs> so in the world of browns, especially in distress, there's warming, cool browns. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So there is brown that's going to have more warm undertones, like reds and yellows, and cool undertones, which are more greens and blues. So Vintage Photo is a warm brown. It has a lot of red, russet kind of colors. Walnut stain, cool brown, a lot of green undertones. And so when you apply those to a surface, okay, this is going to be a very reddish brown. This, a very greenish brown. Can you see that? So when I wet it, also very, very different. This is going to give me kind of that red value, that orange value. This is going to give me that darker kind of green chocolate value. And as we go through the palette of browns, and you'll see just as, I mean, it'll dry right before your eyes, as you can see it. Totally different tones. That's the, that's the difference. It's, and throughout the palette, the when, it actually when it oxidizes, oxidizes yeah, because the whole similar. thing, it's, yeah, almost all the colors when they oxidize, and the more water you add, the more that white, because it is, it's an oxidized layer. But when I oxidize, like we're just gonna let that air dry and you'll see these will actually oxidize slightly different because there's more undertone. Mm -hmm. But throughout the whole palette of distress, like for example, brush corduroy, that's a warm brown, okay? Frayed burlap, cool brown. Ground espresso, right. cool brown. Other thing was, um, I did a lot of playing on black paper mm -hmm. and was really trying to find a way to get the color to sit up on top of the black. And only you're only going to get the, the oxidized. You're right. only going to get the pigment. Right. Okay. It's still a fusion. If it was if it was pure pigment ink, and you've ever tried to stamp on black cards that are with pigment ink, everything sits on top mm -hmm. because it's pigment. Mm -hmm. Right. But this is dye and pigment, so those colors will separate. So when you put it on black cardstock, unless you missed it, you'll miss it, and you'll get most of that oxidized to sit on the top, but it will not be a true pigment color right. on black. The darker you get, the harder it is. But if you had any type of stamp positioner, whether it's a platform, a misty, whatever, and you built a second layer, right. that color would sit on top. Right. So you could get it to do it that way. You could put a sec yeah, you could put a second layer on there and that pigment would sit on top because technically it's right. not touching a black layer, it's touching a an oxide layer. layer. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you can build these. That that's kinda like that whole first tag that I was showing, like when you put more and more and more with oxide, whatever is on top is what you'll see. Forget is there what's a down there. black paper that is somewhat coated that will it'll kind of sit up on top? There of is it? a black Manila, but it's not that much different than black cardstock. Okay. Not from not from a price point standpoint. Okay. It's about a dollar a piece, and it, it's not that different. Yeah. But my advice is to stamp it twice, or if you're doing a background, just do multiple layers, and you will get color to sit on there. Okay. It just won't be on your first layer because your first layer kind of what I showed you on your tag, that dye wants to separate from that pigment. And the dye, because it's translucent, is just dissolved by that black surface. The other just right. adds a layer. What if you put the distress glaze down first? On top of the or in between? You could totally do that. That would definitely help. Okay. Yeah, you could seal a layer first. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work, but you could seal a layer. Unless you want to stamp twice. Look how those oxidized totally different. Yeah. Which, which one do you want? On this? Vintage photo. Yeah, the, yeah, vintage photo is that warm honey tones, and that's walnut stain. But see, this oxidized, and that was the same amount of water, yeah. so they oxidize different, but like, I'm sure when I did the swatch, I was just juicing it up, because the more you add, the more it will just keep oxidizing, and you can get pretty much every color to oxidize the same. That, to me, is just freaking magic, because see, and you just do that, so. All right, cool. that was fun. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.